This video is part of the series in the first course in modelling, analysis and control and the focus now is on an introduction to behaviours. So discussing behaviour. Control engineers can be quite imprecise. When they talk about stability, poles, zeros and behaviours, they sometimes refer to signals and sometimes to transfer functions or systems. Now this sloppiness is excusable because a transfer function representing a system appears in the output signal from a system and hence there's sort of an equivalence between the signal and the system. And system behaviour is therefore inferred from the transfer function of a system. So the rest of these slides focus on the transform itself, not necessarily its origins. Is it a signal or is it a system? But as a user, you must be clear in your own mind. Are you talking about a signal or are you talking about a system? So what's the difference then between a Laplace transform and a transfer function? This is very important as students who get these mixed up will make lots of mistakes. Let's introduce the concept of a system. That's something which has inputs and outputs. Imagine you are interested in the speed of a car. The input might be defined as the throttle position. That's something that you as the driver can change. The output might be defined as the car speed. And obviously the system is the car itself. The speed depends upon the choice of input or throttle position and the car dynamics, which is the car. So what can you see? We have a model for the car. There's the model for the car. OK, within that model, we have an input F and we also have a signal for the speed V. Now, what we'd like to do is represent that by some conceptual equivalent where you see we've got the input coming in to the car and what comes out is the output or the speed. So we're going to introduce this concept of a transfer function and a block diagram. So if we start with a model and take Laplace transforms of every term in the model, so we did that in the Laplace notes, and then rearrange, we end up with this model over here in transforms. Now what I can do is I can put some brackets around this bit and you can see now that I've separated the input from the output, the velocity, and also the model parameters or the parameters of the car. Now, why is that useful? So you can see we can now represent this using a block diagram, a bit like this. You can see the V has gone there. You can see the F has gone there. And you see the model parameters have gone there. So the key thing is this block diagram is a representation of that model. OK, and now the bit in the middle, this bit here, is called the transfer function because that represents the system or the car. Let's do a second order example and we can do an equivalent process, in fact, with any order of ODE. So you see we've got an ODE here. If we take Laplace transforms of every term in that model and then rearrange it, once again, you see we end up with this interesting format. We have the output over here, we have the input over here, and then in the middle, we have parameters which represent the system model. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this bit in the middle, this bit here, it's called a transfer function model. It represents the relationship between the output and the input, which is dictated by the parameters of your system. So what we've got here is we've got a Laplace transform, which represents, sorry, my writing's not brilliant, which represents the signals Y and U. So those are Laplace transforms. And then G of S is a transfer function because it represents a system, not a signal. Block diagram representations then. So what we tend to do is represent these relationships. You can see the relationship down here at the bottom, y equals gu, using these block diagrams. So whenever you see a block diagram like this, you immediately think that is just equivalent to this mathematical expression at the bottom. So the arrow going in is the transform of the input. The arrow coming out is the transform of the output. And the box in the middle 
is the transfer function. So you see we have boxes for systems and lines or arrows for signals. And this is simply a representation. It's a convenient way of representing what's going on. Now, this helps if you have a number of systems which are interconnected. So you can see here I have interconnected systems, systems F, G and H. <coughs> so if we look at this top one here, this system here, I could work out, if I just do it quickly, that the transfer function model is going to be F equals 2 over S plus 4. And that gives me the relationship between the signal U and the signal W. Next, I've got this middle system, dz dt plus z equals w, so I can write down a transfer function g equals 1 over s plus 1 to represent the relationship between w and z. And then finally, I've got y equals hz, and you can very quickly see that h is going to be 4 over s plus 3. Okay, and that gives you the relationship between z and y. Now, having got all of those relationships, what you can now see, so if I, you'll see I've grouped them here, I've got those three relationships in there. If I exploit all of those, I end up with this resulting relationship, that the Laplace transform of the output signal Y is linked to the Laplace transform of this signal U on the far left by the expression H times G times W. And that's a lot easier to deal with than the original three ordinary differential equations. So this is one of the reasons that people like block diagrams as a representation. So remarks on behaviour then. So y equals gu, and therefore the output behaviours of y are going to include dynamics inherent in the process g, or the transfer function g, and also dynamics inherent in the input signal u. So the behaviours of y come from both g and u. And as was evident from inverse Laplace, if you go and relook at those resources, the behaviour is linked to the poles in the transforms. And here we do not need to distinguish whether those behaviours come from G or U, because both behaviours are going to exist in the output Y. So, having established where the behaviours come from, next we want to ask ourselves what do we mean by that? So behaviours are a characterisation of a signal into its component parts. So those component parts might be constants, exponentials, polynomials, sine waves, or exponentials times sine waves. So we want to characterize the behavior of the system into which of these components appear in the output. Now, the good thing here is we're not usually interested in the residues or partial fractions in detail. All we want to know is which of these signals exist within the output. So how might we characterize different behaviors? Well, the sorts of characteristics we're interested in are the steady state. Where do the signals settle? This one here you can see is unstable or divergent, which is not good, but we want to know, does that appear in our output? Have we got oscillatory responses? You can see here the response goes up and down a lot. Have we got simple convergent responses, which are smooth? This one is slow. And this one is fast. So this is really what we mean by characterization, looking at the signals and saying what sort of characteristics do they have. So let's look at how we might assess these. A key characteristic is the steady state behavior of a signal. And within inverse Laplace, we showed that you could get these values using the final value theorem, but obviously only if the limit exists. And some of the warnings we gave you is the only signal with a non-zero steady state is a step function of the form a over s. And if a signal contains pure sinusoids or ramps or divergent exponentials, the steady state cannot be defined. Now, we emphasize here, this slide is talking about signals. What about systems? Well, there's a concept of system steady state gain. So system steady state gain is the ratio, so emphasize that it's the ratio between the steady state output and steady state input. Now we can actually deduce this using the final value theorem as follows. You can see what we're interested in is the asymptotic ratio between the output and the input. 
And therefore, the limit as t goes to infinity of y divided by the limit as t goes to infinity of u. But both of those can be solved using the final value theorem. Now, if I plug in all the numbers, what you'll notice is I've got a u in both the numerator and denominator, an s in both the numerator and the denominator. And so the formula reduces to this. So we end up with steady state gain is just defined as g of 0, which is nice and simple to compute. Now, a common mistake is to confuse the steady state of a signal with the steady state gain of a system. So please be clear, are you talking about the gain of a system or the steady state of a signal? And another mistake that people can make is only convergent signals have a steady state, but all systems, even unstable ones, have a steady state gain. Next characteristic we're interested in then is speed of response. And this is best characterized by the time constant or equivalently the real part of the pole. You can see here I've got an e to the minus a t and the pole is essentially at minus a. And what you will see is as the pole gets closer to the origin, the convergence is slower. So if we look at this black curve, which is e to the minus t, the pole is at minus one. If we look at the blue curve, the pole is at minus 0.4. We look at the green curve, the pole is at minus 0.2, and for the pink curve, the pole is at minus 0.02. So as the pole moves nearer to the origin, the speed or the convergence gets slower. Now, just for completeness, the implied time constant, if you remember your first order responses, is t equals 1 over a. So, response times, and this is really what you will observe. As the pole moves further to the left, then your convergence or your decay gets faster. Conversely, if your pole moves further to the right, and especially if you're in the right half plane, your divergence gets faster. However, here's a key point. Faster and slower are relative terms, but in absolute terms, what is defined as fast is going to be system dependent. So it's very important that you as the engineer decide what is fast and slow for my particular system. What about systems with complex roots then? So the speed of convergence is upper bounded by the exponential part, which forms an envelope within which the oscillation lies. And you can see that on the figure here. You can see this green dotted line is the envelope given by the exponential. Now, if you look at the poles of your exponential time sign, you can see this envelope is actually governed by the real part of the pole, this e to the minus a t. So the speed of response is linked to the real part of the pole, and so the implied time constant is t equals 1 over a. Stability of a signal. Without wanting to be too rigorous, for an introductory course, stability can be interpreted as equivalent to convergence. This means all the poles must be in the left half plane, except perhaps a single pole on the origin. So here you can see I've got e to the minus 3t, the pole is at minus 3, this is in the left half plane, the signal is convergent, I'm stable. e to the 4t, the pole is at 4, it's in the right half plane, the signal is divergent, I'm unstable. And here's an exponential times a sign, and you can see here the pole is at minus 1 plus or minus j, which is in the left half plane, the signal is convergent, I'm stable. But this one here, e to the t sine 2t, the pole is at 1 plus or minus 2j, which is in the right half plane, so the signal is divergent and it's unstable. What about stability of a system then? A system transfer function is said to be stable if all its poles are in the left half plane. Now we need to emphasize here all of its poles have to be in the left half plane, which is equivalent to how we've just treated a signal. A single integrator, that is a single pole on the origin, could be interpreted as stable or unstable, depending upon the context. So you need to be a bit flexible there. Normally, poles on the imaginary axis are considered as unstable as continuous oscillation, as you get from something like a cosine or a sine, is bad in most real systems. And here you'll see the poles are at plus or minus j omega, which is the imaginary axis. What about oscillatory systems then? For this oscillatory system, you can see the real part of the pole from this s plus 1 is at minus 1. 
and the imaginary part comes from this 6 and you can see I've got a lot of oscillation compared to the decay. So in this case the oscillation is dominating the decay because the omega is far far bigger than the A or if you calculated the damping ratio you'd find it's quite small and that would tend to be bad. You would not be happy with that. What about this system here? Now here you can see the real part is minus 1 and the imaginary part of the pole is also 1. So in this case we've got omega equals A and a damping ratio of about 0.7 and probably you would consider this is OK because it's converging fast enough so the oscillation doesn't give you a problem. Some insight then, what you might do with all these pole positions. So what we've established is the further left you go, the faster you become. So clearly, if you are too far to the right, if you're too close to the imaginary axis, then you're too slow. So that's unsatisfactory. Now, obviously, that's a relative measure. You have to decide. We've also said that if your imaginary part dominates over your real part, you're likely to be too oscillatory. So that's going to be unsatisfactory. So what you've got is you've got a region down here where you're thinking, OK, everything's good enough. You've got a region somewhere in the middle where it's debatable whether your behaviour is acceptable or not. And then you've got other regions where clearly it's not. And obviously, anything in the right half plane is not allowed. So some conclusions. There are several characteristics an engineer would like embedded within their system behaviour. You need to calculate the steady state gain and then you obviously have to ask, is this correct or not? Response time. Now this is based upon the time constant or real part of the pole and you need to say, is it fast enough? Do I converge fast enough for my system? Convergence or stability. Do I converge at all or do I diverge? And essentially that means your poles have to be in the left half plane. And smooth responses. How much oscillation are you prepared to put up with? And what's the impact of that on your damping ratio? So this video has given a quick overview of how these characteristics are linked to a Laplace transform model. And it's emphasised the importance of poles being in the left half plane and indeed far enough into the left half plane to give the desired speed.